Check this out, bro. What's that, Brahim? I started attending the nude service at COH, and I like it more. You like the nude service? More? Yeah, Professor. The people sing a lot louder, and the sermon is way better. More people singing, and better preaching? Nice, Brotato Chip. That's not all, Protein Shake. There's more. I get to sleep in, get to church on time, and get some free coffee. Oh yeah, that's a lot better. I'm all about that noon service, Teddy Roosevelt. I'll see you at the noon o'clock service, bro Diddy. Uh, well. I just want to check, is Brandon in here? Where is the brotator chip? Is he, I mean, is he in the house or not? No, let me tell you, I'm not picking on him. He's actually getting ready for kids' ministry. But I leaned over to Shelly and I was like, I'm going to just see if he's in here right now. Well, anyhow, all right. Hey, um, I want you to notice, too, as we go through these videos every week, if you notice the longer the, the video goes on, do you notice that they start to kind of melt doing the, yeah? I just Okay, those are real weights, by the way. All right. Hey, um, I wanted to, I'm excited about this series and, and the content of what we're going to be talking about, and I want to begin today by asking you a question, okay? So how many of you, by a show of your hands, would say that you're personally doing some exercise or some discipline in your life right now to either maintain your healthy shape or to get back into shape, okay, all right? Or some of you have just given up. How many of you would just say you've given up? Right? Okay. And uh, I want to know that because, you know, most of us, when you see a, a body that's healthy, you, you know that it's healthy, right? You can tell that. In fact, how many Olympic, uh, uh, Olympic fans in the room ready for the Olympics coming up? I'd like to see, ask a little question. Okay. How many of you like Winter Olympics better? No, nobody. All right. One person. Okay. How many of you like Summer? The Summer Olympics are better. You like that better. Okay. So it's kind of interesting. So I was reading an article. We're 26 days away from the Summer Olympics. And I was reading an article around some of the athletes that we should be watching uh, over the next, uh, uh, this next Olympic event. And I want to share the, some new names with you. Simone Biles, uh, Katie Ledecky, and Missy Franklin. These, are, these ladies right here are rock stars. And they're saying we should be watching them do their thing. And we're going to also see some of the older athletes, some of the ones we've seen before. And uh, there are two primarily to, uh, primary to watch, and you probably know who they are already. One is Usain Bolt. Yeah. And the other one, of course, Michael Phelps. So fastest swimmer in the world on the right, fastest runner in the world on the left. And I was reading an article about these guys. They consume, you guys, 12,000 calories a day. See, you're like me. I'm not impressed. I could do that. I mean, I read that. I'm like, big deal. I could do that. I'm going to go try this afternoon to do that right when church is over. I was reading about Usain Bolt. During the Beijing games, he consumed 100 chicken nuggets every day for two weeks. Man. Rotator chip right there. It's pretty awesome, isn't it? So I was thinking about that, and most of us, you know, when you see these guys and you see these ladies that we showed just a moment ago, I mean, you can tell elite athletes. Uh, they have a stance. They just have a posture around them. It's easy to see that, okay? But I, here's a question I want us to think about, and we're going to be thinking about it over the next several weeks together. I wonder if we could really tell what would happen if we were suddenly able to look at everybody's spiritual health? What would we discover? I've been moved by the idea that the Bible actually says this. The Bible says that God doesn't look at the outward appearance, but God looks at the heart. And you know, sometimes when you go to movies and you go to see those um, 
those 3D movies and you go and they give you the glasses that you put on and you see things you wouldn't otherwise see. What happens if everybody came to church next weekend and when you walked in, we gave you spiritual glasses and you put them on and you could tell the spiritual disposition of every heart in the room. Can you imagine what that would look like? I mean, I, I mean, I wonder what we would discover. What happens if you put them on and looked in the mirror? What would you discover? What would be, what would be missing? What would be some of the gaps that we would discover? And see, part of what the Bible does is the Bible not only tells us reality, but here's the thing. The Bible paints a picture of what a life with Christ could look like if we fully vested into it. And it's very different. It's a picture. It's a vision. And, and I don't know if you know this or not, but a lot of, of us who do church work, we're, we're visionary people by nature. We just, we have a dream. We've locked on to a dream of what life could be for a fully devoted follower of Christ. And I wonder not even so much even just about our individual lives, but what if we could tell the spiritual climate of a church when we walked in? What would that body of Christ look like? What would be the gaps? I mean, a lot of us are passionate about community of hope. I certainly am. But what happens if we could all of a sudden put on lenses and go, oh, I, I, see, I see how this church really is. Would we like what we see? And I think this is the kind of thing that the Apostle Paul was getting at when Paul wrote the book of Ephesians. Now, here's what we know historically. He was under house arrest. And scholars believe that he, that he languished in house arrest for a period of two years. And during this period of two years, he wrote what many scholars refer to as the prison epistles, the prison letters. They're the book of Ephesians, the book of Philippians, the book of Colossians, and his letter to Philemon, his friend. They're the prison, the prison epistles. And my favorite prison epistle of all of them is the book of Ephesians. It was a, a book that I read as a young follower of Christ where I feel like I really cut my teeth, if you will, on what biblical Christianity ought to look like. And uh, when you get to the book of Ephesians and you motor on over to the fourth chapter, you get Paul's vision for how the church is supposed to work and what it's to look like to the world. And I want us to focus on this uh, this afternoon now, and we're going to be looking at it and parts of it and components of it over the next few weeks together. But in Ephesians chapter 4, we pick up on verse 11, and this is how Paul describes his vision of the church. It's very captivating. He says this, So Christ himself gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors, and teachers to equip God's people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son and we become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. For then we will no longer be infants, tossed back and forth by waves, blown here and there by every wind of teaching and by the cunning and craftiness of people in their deceitful scheming. But instead, Paul says, Speaking truth and love, we will grow to become in every respect the mature body of him who is the head. That is Christ. For from him the whole body, joined and held together by every supporting ligament, grows and builds itself up in love as each part does its work. Now think with me for a few moments about that. I, I, I don't know about you. I was taken with a phrase earlier this spring, and that became the idea behind this series. And the phrase, I think, happens there in verse 12, that the body of Christ may be built up. What would it look like for a body of Christ to be fully formed, to be fully fit? I wonder what would happen if you and I were to begin to just kind of talk about that and I were to bring a board maybe up on the stage and we were to write down all the different areas, all the different components that if a body of Christ was fully fit, fully formed, fully functional, this is the kind of uh, idea that it would aspire toward. What would that look like? And see, this is Paul's vision. 
Then I thought about this, and I thought, you know what? It's interesting because, you know, it's Paul's vision because Paul was a direct recipient of a fully formed, fully functional, fully fit body of Christ. Because, see, many of us knew him before he was Paul. He was, say it with me, Saul. And we remember that. He was Saul of Tarsus. And he came into contact with the risen Christ. He came into contact with that very first body of Christ formed in Jesus' name. And it changed and transformed every single aspect about his life as it can still do for your and my life even today. And so I thought about this and I thought, you know, it'd be interesting, Dale, to take all of Paul's writings and all of Paul's ideas around what it means to be a functional member in the body of Christ. And rather maybe than start with the body, I thought, hey, let's start individually. Let's start with those of us uh, who are I self-identify as followers of Christ. And I started thinking about this, and I started thinking about the grand sweep of what, what probably transpired in, in Saul's life that led him by the time we got over to Acts chapter 13. It's the first mention that he isn't Saul anymore, but now he's Paul. And I thought, gosh, I wonder, wonder what that would look like. And I noticed three exercises, three disciplines, that Paul engaged in that I want to share with you this afternoon. And here's the the thing. I call them the three aerobic exercises of fully fit Christ followers. Okay, that's what they are. And here's the first one. We learn to walk by faith. There it is. Say it with me. We walk by faith. Say it again. We walk by faith. When Paul was writing to the, his, the church in Rome, in Corinth, he says this, for we walk by faith and not by sight. In the amplified version of 2 Corinthians 5, it says this, for we walk by faith, we begin to regulate our lives and our conduct by the conviction or belief that we have respecting humanity's relationship to God and the divine things that are going on. With trust and holy fervor, we walk not by sight, and we walk not by appearance. Now, i got to tell you, um, as a dad, uh, one of the things that I certainly remember uh, are, are those first fledgling steps that each of our daughters took when they began to not crawl any longer, but they began to walk. And we've been having a lot of memories together uh, over this time because our family is growing and they're getting older and we're all finding our way. And so summer comes and we get some days together. We got about 20 or 25 days left, maybe even less than that. And then we're all going to scatter again all across the country. We're not, the girls will no longer be under my roof. They'll still be in my wallet, but they won't be in under my roof. Okay. And I was kind of thinking about all that. and, And I saw a picture this week that reminded me of how we've grown. Look at that. That's, that's Haley and Shelly. And do you know who that is? That's Chad Fayus. That's the dude that leads worship up here when, when sometimes when Billy's in town and sometimes when Billy's not in town. That's the dude right there. And I thought about, look, at there they are in our driveway. And I thought, oh, my gosh, if, if that driveway could talk what that driveway's seen over the last, I don't know, 20 years, you know. But I remember that. I want to show you another little picture equally as captivating. This is little Tessa Johnston taking her first steps in my house. In my house. Not Trevor's house. My house. Isn't that crazy? And I mean, you know what? When, when, when parents see little children taking their first steps... You know how we just going to root them on? We're just all excited about that. Can I tell you, when you as a follower of Christ start to walk by faith, that's what the Heavenly Father thinks of you. He's excited. He's rooting you on. And what does it mean to walk in faith? I mean, that's the calling for many of us in our lives right now. Here's what Jesus, by His Spirit, would say to many of us in this room. Your calling right now is to walk by faith not by sight. 
And when we do that, this is what I kind of think it means. We become open to the idea that God is real, that he loves us, that he wants a relationship with us. We become willing to accept and understand that God, through great sacrifice of his own choosing, made a way that you and I could know him and be known by him. And that's what it means to begin to walk by faith. When we begin to walk by faith, it means that we become willing to let God challenge some of the assumptions we've made about God. huh? Or maybe some of the assumptions we've made about ourselves. And maybe some of the assumptions we've made about other people. And we become pliable and open to God's spirit to do some changing. And that's the calling for many of us in this room. That you would walk by faith and not by sight. This is a challenge for us. And when Paul was writing this kind of thing, Paul was uh, influenced by what it meant to walk by faith. And I want us to notice that the, 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 the margin, that the marker is not set at knowledge. Did you notice that? And knowledge is a great thing. The Bible says aspire to have knowledge about God. But here's what I want to tell you as a grace to all of us this afternoon. God has set the marker. The beginning place is not on knowledge. It's on faith. And we know in Hebrews 11, 1, it says, as faith is the evidence of things hoped for, a conviction of things not yet seen. So God, I don't understand everything. You don't need to understand everything. God, I'm confused about that. It's okay to have some confusion. Just walk by faith. Get up and walk by faith, not by sight. And that's the first mark, amen, (laughs) that's the first mark of an aerobically fit follower of Christ. But here's the thing, some of us, our calling in this room is not to walk by faith any longer, just that. We continue to do it, but not just that. God is calling some of us not only to walk by faith, he's calling some of us, here's the second aerobic exercise, to run with perseverance. That's another exercise of a fully fit follower of Christ. See, there comes a moment when we don't walk any longer. Now we have to run. And we run with perseverance. In fact, I really believe the Spirit of Christ would say to some of us in this room, honestly, He would say, you've walked long enough. It's time to run with perseverance. Now, what do you mean by that, Pastor Dale? What's the difference? Well, I noticed some interesting things. And this comes really in the book of Hebrews. And you've heard me say the author of the book of Hebrews is a little unknown to us. But in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1, notice what it says here. It says, therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders us and sin that so easily entangles us. And here it is. Let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us. And I want you to notice, first of all, that is your race, not my race. I got a race to run, and I'm running my race, but here's what I want everybody to know. If you're following Jesus, you have a race to run. Are you running your race? Whenever I get to this verse in Scripture, you know what I always think about? I think about when my dad died. And my dad stepped out to be with the Lord June 17, 2008. And on the 21st of June, we did a service for my dad. And I'll never forget this. My older brother stood up in the service and came down. And he stood behind, beside my dad's casket. And he put his hand on my dad's casket. And he looked out at a crowd. There's about four or 500 people. There was a huge crowd. And this is what my brother said. I'll never forget it. I'll take it to my grave. He said, our dad has run his race. His race is now complete. But God has outfitted every single one of us who are here today as followers of Christ, he said, to run your race. And he said, are you running it? Because you have a race to run like our father had a race to run. And so some of us are here this afternoon and we're discouraged and things are not going right. And the writer of the book of Hebrews, that we don't really know who it is. I I can tell you, I was doing some study on that this week and a lot of scholars suggest maybe it was Barnabas because Barnabas had such an understanding of, of Jewish tradition and Jewish theology, but he was a fully formed follower of Christ. And I can tell you, if it was Barnabas, we'll never know. If it was, he he was influenced by Paul. 
Paul's handprints are all, all over him. And, 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 and part of what it means to run with perseverance is to begin to allow God's word to have something to say about the folly-prone areas of our lives. You notice what the writer says? Let us throw off the sin that so easily entangles us. Things that we think we know that we don't know. We say, God, I don't know, but I need to know. I need to run with perseverance. And if I'm going to run with perseverance when I'm discouraged, I need to continue to do that. And you need to move me into greater awarenesses of you. You know, it's interesting with all the stuff that's going on in our country right now. I mean, I don't know how you feel. I feel like we're going backwards. And, and I was talking to a neighbor, a guy in my neighborhood, and he's an African-American brother, and, and, and we were talking about all the stuff that's going on, and, and, and he has young sons like I have daughters around the same age, and this is what he said to me. He said, you know, my, my sons are afraid to get pulled over. And I listened to that, and, and, and that stayed with me all day. And I'm journaling the next day on my back porch. And I, I'll be honest with you guys. I felt like the Holy Spirit say to me, Dale, you don't have any idea what that guy's talking about. Now, you think you do, but you don't. And I got to tell you, it was a moment of humility for me and just saying, you know, Lord, I, I need to better understand what some of our brothers and sisters are feeling. And some of what's going on in our culture right now is they're trying to tell us something. And we might not agree with everything they're saying or how they're saying it, but they're saying some stuff. And we don't understand. And I got to tell you something else I want everybody to understand too. I was thinking about that on my back porch, and I thought, you know what? I also don't know what it feels like to put on a uniform and go to work and wonder whether or not I'm coming home. And I can say I think I know what that feels like, but the reality is this. I don't. I don't. And part of what it means to be a body of Christ is that we refuse to stop. We refuse, watch me now, to hoard truth. It's not meant to be hoarded. It's meant to be shared. And God is calling you and I as followers of Christ to be the people, to be the ones who rise up and come against that. We just heard it. What does God require of us? Act justly. Love mercy. And walk humbly with God. Here it is. So the first aerobic exercise is to walk by faith. The second aerobic exercise is to run with perseverance. There's one other exercise. You can miss it if you're not careful. It's to stand against the enemy. And if you're looking back in the book of Ephesians in chapter 6, verses 10 through 13, notice what Paul says. He says, finally, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle, look at this, our struggle is not against flesh, it's not against blood, but it's against rulers and authorities and powers in a dark world and against spiritual forces of evil in heavenly realms. Therefore, put on the full armor of God so that when the evil day comes, you'll be able to stand your ground. And after you've done, you've done everything else, stand. I've said it before. It's like Paul is saying, stand, and when you're through standing, stand some more. And I just wonder what would happen if the body of Christ would be the, be the one place that would stand up and sometimes stand out. What about it? I think God is saying to his bride this phrase, and I want it to haunt every one of us in this room and to those streaming online. I think God is saying to us in this moment, are you with me? Are you with me? That's always been what he's asking. 
Are you with me? I'm talking to a lot of people right now in our culture, and this is what I hear. I hear people saying, some people right in our church are saying this, man, I just, I'm going to go home. I'm not ever going to leave the house. I'm just going to go home. And I'll tell you what, that's not your calling. It's not our calling to stay home. It's our calling to stand up and stand out against the forces of this world. Let me just tell you what. Part of what it means to stand against the enemy is to acknowledge, first of all, there is one. And can I tell you, it's not our neighbor. It's not. It's the one who wants to take your soul and destroy your family. Scripture said it this way, don't don't fear the one who takes this life. Fear the one who will take your soul. Careful with that. And so what what would it look like to be a fully formed, fully fit, aerobically robust body of Christ. We're going to take the next several weeks and you know what we're going to do? We're all going to get in shape. Come on. I mean, I know you're looking at me going, well, you're already in shape and (laughs) we should probably pray now. (laughs) Let's pray. Lord, will you help us? We have work to do. There are so many things going on like right now, Lord. All of us are in places in our lives where stuff is going on in our lives. And God, we need wisdom. We need to know how to persevere. We got stuff right now we don't understand. And your challenge to us is to walk by faith and not by sight. To trust, oh God, that you're at work on our behalf in ways we can't see and don't understand. There are spiritual forces that threaten to destroy our families, destroy our nation, destroy our world. The fight is real. As you're asking for your bride to step up, to stand out, and take the fight to the enemy. And you fight on our behalf. And so God, help us. Help us be the ones in every situation that we would be the ones, oh God, that you could rely on to be those who love not only with our words, but with our deeds. Because there's a lot at stake and we need your help. And this we pray in the strong and mighty name of Jesus for his sake and his sake alone. And everyone said, amen. Would you stand? You know, uh, our, our prayer team is here and we always like to say, that if you got a big need before you leave, it's important to come this way and maybe have somebody pray for you. If you've never given your life to Jesus Christ, bowed your knee or opened your heart and said, Lord, would you be my Lord and leader, my forgiver, my friend? This is the moment to do that, really. I mean, why not? But until then, would you receive this blessing? Would you go from this place And would you dispense yourself out as a body of Christ into our community and in our world? And would you accept the responsibility under Christ to be the one who spreads abroad the fragrance of the knowledge of the Son of God in every place? To Him be the glory and the glory alone. Amen and amen. God bless you. We'll see you next weekend.